Act two, scene, the same. The door into the living room is shut, into the dining room is shut. It is morning. Mrs. Stockman, with a sealed letter in her hand, comes in from the dining room, goes to the door of the doctor's study and peeps in. Are you in, Thomas? Yes, I've just come in. He comes into the room. What is it? A letter from your brother. Ah, let us see. <clears throat> I return here with the manuscript you sent me. What does he say? Uh, oh, he only writes that he will come up here himself about midday. Well, try and remember to be home this time. Oh, that will be all right. I've got through all my morning visits. I'm extremely curious to know how he takes it. You will see he won't like it having been I and not he that made the discovery. Aren't you a little nervous about that? Oh, he really will be pleased enough, you know. But at the same time, Peter is so confoundedly afraid of anyone's doing any service to the town except himself. I will tell you what, Thomas, you should be good-natured and share the credit of this with him. Couldn't you make out that it was he who set you on the scent of this discovery? I am quite willing. If only I can get the thing set right, I... Uh... Morton Kill puts his he head in through the door leading from the hall, looks around in an inquiring manner and chuckles. Is it... is it true? Father, is it you? Ah, Mr. Kill. Good morning, good morning. But come along in. If it is true, I will. If not, I am off. If what is true? The tale of our, about the water supply. Is it true? Well, certainly it is true, but how did you come to hear it? Petra ran in on her way to the school. Did she? Yes, and she declares that. I thought she was only making a fool of me. But it isn't Petra to do that. Of course not. How could you imagine such a thing? Oh, well, it is better never to trust anybody. You may find you've been made a fool out of before. You know where you are. But it is, is it, really, it is really true all the same? You can depend upon it that it is true. Won't you sit down? Isn't it a real bit of luck for the town? <laughs> a bit of luck for the town? Yes, that I made the discovery in good time. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but I should never have thought you were the sort of man to pull your own brother's leg like this. Pull his leg? Really, Father dear? Let me see, what was the story? Uh, some kind of uh, beast that had got into the water pipes, wasn't it? Infusoria, yes. And a lot of these beasts had got in, according to Petra. A tremendous lot. Certainly. Hundreds of thousands of them, probably. But no one can see them, isn't that so? Yes, you can't see them. <laughs> Damn, it's the finest story I've ever heard. What do you mean? Oh, but you will never get the mayor to believe something like that. Ah, uh, we shall see. Do you think he will be fool enough to... Well, I hope the whole town will be fools enough. The whole town? Well, it wouldn't be a bad thing. It would just serve them right and teach them a lesson. They think themselves so much cleverer than we old fellows. They hounded me out of the castle, they did. I tell you, they hounded me out. Now they shall pay for it. You pull their legs too, Thomas. Really, I... You pull their legs. If you can work it so the mayor and his friends all swallow the same bait, I will give you ten pounds to charity, like a shot. That is very kind of you. Yes, I haven't got much money to throw away, I can tell you, but if you can work this, I will give five pounds to a charity at Christmas. Hofstad comes in by the hall door. Good morning! Oh, I beg your pardon? Oh, not at all. Come in. Oh, is he in this too? What do you mean? Certainly he is. I might have known it. It must get into the papers. You know how to do it, Thomas. Set your wits to work. Now, I must go. Well, won't you stay a little while? No, I must be off. You keep up this game for all it's worth. You won't repent it. I'm damned if you will. 
He goes out. Mrs. Stockman follows him into the hall. <laughs> oh, just imagine. The old chap doesn't believe a word of all of this about the water supply. Oh, that was it then? Yes, that was what we were talking about. Perhaps it is the same thing that brings you here. Yes, it is. Can you spare me a few minutes, Doctor? As long as you like, my dear fellow. Have you heard from the mayor yet? Not yet. He is coming here later. I've given the matter a great deal of thought since last night. Well? From your point of view, as a doctor and a man of science, this affair of the water supply is an isolated matter. I mean, you do not realise that it involves a great many other things. How do you mean? Look, let us sit down, my dear fellow. No, sit here on the couch. Now then, you mean that... You said yesterday that the pollution of the water was due to the impurities of the soil. Yes, unquestionably it is due to the poisonous morass at the Mulladal. Begging your pardon, Doctor. I fancy it's due to quite another morass altogether. What morass? The morass that the whole life of, our, life of our town is built on and is rotting in. What the deuce are you driving at, Hofstadt? The whole of this town's interests have, little by little, got into the hands of a pack of, of officials. Come, they're not all officials. No, but those that are not officials are at any rate the officials' friends and adherents. It is the wealthy folk, the old families in the town that have got us entirely in their hands. Yes, but after all, they are men of ability and knowledge. Did they show any ability or knowledge when they laid the conduit pipes where they are now? No, of course, that was a great piece of stupidity on their part. But that is going to be set right now. Do you think that will all be such plain sailing? Plain sailing or no, it has got to be done anyway. Yes, provided the press takes up the question. I don't think that will be necessary, my dear fellow. I'm certain my brother will... Excuse me, Doctor. I feel bound to tell you I'm inclined to take the matter up. In the paper? Yes. When I took over the People's Messenger, my idea was to break up this ring of old, self-opinionated fossils who had got hold of all the influence. But you know you told me yourself what the result had been. You nearly ruined your paper. Yes, at the time we were obliged to climb down a peg or two. It is quite true, because there was a danger of the whole project of the baths coming to nothing if they failed us. But now the scheme has been carried through and we can dispense with these grand gentlemen. Dispense with them, yes. But we owe them a great debt of gratitude. That shall be recognised ungrudgingly. But a journalist of my de democratic tendencies cannot let such an opportunity as this slip. The bubble of official infallibility must be pricked. The superstition must be destroyed like any other. I am wholeheartedly with you in that, Mr. Hart. If it is a superstition, away with it. I should be very reluctant to bring the mayor into it, because he is your brother. But I am sure you will agree with me that the truth should be first consideration. Well, that goes without saying. Uh, yes, but... Uh, but uh... You must not misjudge me. I am neither more self-interested nor more ambitious than most men. My dear fellow, who suggests anything of the kind? I am of humble origin, as you know, and that has given me opportunities of knowing what, what is the most crying need in the humbler ranks of life. It is they that should be allowed some part in the direction of public affairs, Doctor. That is what will develop their faculties of intelligence and self-respect. Quite appreciate that. Yes, and in my opinion, a journalist incurs a heavy responsibility if he neglects a favourable op opportunity of emancipating the masses the humble and oppressed. I know well enough that in exalted circles I shall be called an agitator and all that sort of thing, but they may call me what they like. If only my conscience, conscience doesn't reproach me, then... Quite right, quite right, Mr. Hofstadt. But all the same, I'll oh, devil take it. A knock is heard at the door. Come in. A slack sen appears at the door. He is poorly but decently dressed, in black with a slightly crumpled white neckcloth. He wears gloves and has a felt hat in his hand. Excuse my taking the liberty, Doctor. Ah, it is you, Aslaxkan. Yes, Doctor. Is it me you want, Aslaxkan? No, I didn't know I should find you here. No, it was the Doctor I... Uh... I am quite 
quite at your service. What is it? Is what I heard from Mr. Billing true, sir, that you mean to improve our water supply? Yes, for the baths. Quite so, I understand. Well, I, I've come to say that I will be back, I will back that up by every means in my power. You see? I shall be very grateful to you, but... Uh... Because it may be no bad thing to have us all small tradesmen at your back. We form, as it were, a compact majority in the town, if we choose. And it is always a good thing to have the majority with you, Doctor. That is undeniably true. But I confess I don't see why such unusual precautions should be necessary in this case. It seems to me that such a plain, straightforward thing... Oh, it may be very desirable all the same. I, I know our local authorities so well. Officials are not generally very ready to act on proposals that come from other people. That is why I think it would not be at all amiss if we made a little demonstration. That's right. Demonstration, did you say? What on earth are you going to make a demonstration about? We shall proceed with the greatest moderation, Doctor. Moderation is always my aim. It is the greatest virtue in a citizen. At least, I think so. It is well known to be a characteristic of yours, Mr. Alaxo. Yes, I think I may pride myself on that. And this matter of the water supply is of the greatest importance to us small tradesmen. The baths promise to be a regular gold mine for the town. We shall all make our living out of them, especially those of us who are householders. That is why we will back up the project as strongly as possible. And as I am at present chairman of the Householders Association. Yes. And what is more, local secretary of the Temperance Society. You know, sir, I suppose that I am a worker in a temperance cause. Yeah, of course, of course. Well, you can understand that I come into contact with a great many people. And as I have the reputation of a temperate and law-abiding citizen, like yourself, Doctor, I have a certain influence in the town, a little bit of power, if I may be allowed to say so. I know that quite well, Mr. Aslaxon. So you see, it would be an easy matter for me to set on foot some testimonial, if necessary. A testimonial? Yes, some kind of an address of thanks from the townsman for your share in a matter of such importance to the community. I need scarcely say that it would have to be drawn up with the greatest regard to moderation so as not to offend the authorities, who, after all, have the reins in their hands. If we pay strict attention to that, no one can take it amiss, I should think. Well, and even supposing they didn't like it... No, 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 that there must be no discourtesy to the authorities, Mr. Hofstadt. It is no use falling foul of those upon whom our welfare so closely depends. I have done that in my time, and no good ever comes of it. No one can take exception to a reasonable and frank expression of a citizen's views. I can't tell you, dear Mr. Aslaxon, how extremely pleased I am to find such hearty support among my fellow citizens. I am delighted, delighted. Now, you will take a small glass of sherry, eh? Uh, no, thank you. I, I never drink alcohol of that kind. Well, what would you say to a glass of beer, then? Nor that either, thank you, Doctor. I never drink anything as early as this. I'm going to town now to talk this over with one or two householders and prepare the ground. It is tremendously kind of you, Mr. Slaxon. But I really cannot understand the necessity for all these precautions. It seems to me that the thing should go of itself. The authorities are somewhat slow to move, Doctor. Far be it from me to seem to blame them. We are going to stir them up in the paper tomorrow, Aslaskin. But not violently, I trust, Mr. Hofstad. Proceed with moderation or you will do nothing with them. You may take my advice. I have gathered my experience in the school of life. Well, I must say goodbye, Doctor. You now know that we small tradesmen are at your back at all events, like a solid wall. You have the compact majority on your side, Doctor. I am very much obliged, dear Mrs. Lassen. Goodbye. Goodbye. Are you going my way towards the printing office, Mr. Hofstad? I will come later. I have something to settle up first. Very well. He bows and goes out. Stockman follows him into the hall. Well, what do you think of that, Doctor? Don't you think it's high time we stirred a little life into the, all this slackness and vacillation and cowardice? Are you referring to Aslaxon? Yes, I am. He is one of those who are floundering in a bog. Decent enough fellow, though he may be, otherwise. 
and most of the people here are in just the same case seesawing and edging first to one side and then to the other so overcome with caution and scruple that they never dare to step up to take any decided step yes but the slackson seem to me so thoroughly well intentioned there is one thing i esteem higher than that and that is for a man to be self-reliant and sure of himself i think you are perfectly right there that is why I want to seize this opportunity and try, if I cannot manage to put a little virility in these well-intentioned people for once. The idol of authority must be shattered in this town. This gross and inexcusable blunder about the water supply must be brought home to the mind of every municipal voter. Very well. If you are of opinion that it is for the good of the community, so be it. But not until I have had a talk with my brother. Anyway, I will get a leading article ready, and if the mayor refuses to take the matter up, then... Propose such a thing possible. It is conceivable. And in that case... That case, I promise you... Look here. In that case, you may print my report. Every word of it. May I? I have your word for it. Here it is. Take it with you. It can do no harm for you to read it through, and you can give it me back later on. Good. Good. This is what I will do. And now, goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye. Goodbye. You will see everything will run quite smoothly, Mr. Hofstadt. Quite smoothly. Hmm. We shall see. He bows and goes out. Catherine! Oh, you're back. Uh, yes, I've just come from the uh, school. Has he not been here yet? Peter? No, but I have had a long talk with Hofstad. He's quite excited about my discovery. I find it has a much wider bearing than I had first imagined. And he has put his paper at my disposal if necessity should arise. Do you think it will? Not for a moment. But at all events, it makes me feel proud to know that I have the liberal-minded independent press on my side. Yes, and just imagine... I have had a visit from the chairman of the Householders Association. Oh, what did he want? To offer me his support too. They will support me in a body if it should be necessary. Catherine, do you know what I've got behind me? Behind you? No. What have you got behind you? The compact majority. Really? Is that a good thing for you, Thomas? I should think it was a good thing. By Jove, it's a fine thing to feel this bond of brotherhood between oneself and one's fellow citizens. And to be able to do so much that is good and useful, Father. And for one's own native town into the bargain, my child. That was a ring at the bell. Must be he, then. A Come. knock is heard at the door. Come in! Good morning. Glad to see you, Peter. Good morning, Peter. How are you? So, so, thank you. I received from you yesterday, after office hours, a report dealing with the condition of the water at the baths. Yes. Have you read it? Yes, I have. And what have you to say to it? Hmm. Come along, Petra. She and Petra go into the room on the left. Was it necessary to make all these investigations behind my back? Yes, because until I was absolutely certain about it. Then you mean that you're absolutely certain now? Surely you are convinced of that. Is it your intention to bring this document before the Baths Committee as a sort of official communication? Certainly. Something must be done in the matter, and that quickly. As usual, you employ violent expressions in your report. You say, amongst other things, that what we offer visitors in our bath is a permanent supply of poison. Well, can you describe it any other way, Peter? Just think. Water that is poisonous whether you drink it or bathe in it. And this we offer to the poor sick folk who come to us trustfully and pay us at an exorbitant rate to be made well again. And your reasoning leads you to this conclusion that we must build a sewer to draw off the alleged impurities from Molodal and must relay the water conduits. Yes. Do you see any other way out of it? I don't. I made a pretext this morning to go and see the town engineer 
and as if only half seriously, broached the subject of these proposals as a thing we might perhaps have to take under consideration some time later on. Some time later on? He smiled at what he considered to be my extravagance, naturally. Have you taken the trouble to consider what your proposed alterations would cost? According to the information I obtained, the expenses would probably mount up to 15 or 20 thousand pounds. It would cost so much. Yes. And the worst part of it would be that the work would take at least two years. Two years. Two whole years. At least. And what are we to do with the baths in the meantime? Close them? Indeed, we should be obliged to. And do you suppose anyone would come near the place after it had got out that the water was dangerous? Yes, but Peter, that is what it is. And all this at this juncture, just as the baths are beginning to be known. There are other towns in the neighbourhood with qualifications to attract visitors for bargaining purposes. Do you believe, do you suppose they would immediately strain every nerve to divert the entire stream of strangers to themselves? Unquestionably they would. And then where would we be? We should probably have to abandon the whole thing, which has cost us so much money. And then you would have ruined your native town. I should have ruined. It is simply and solely through the baths that the town has before it any future worth mentioning. You know that just as well as I. But what do you think ought to be done then? Your report has not convinced me that the condition of the water at the baths is as bad as you represent it to be. I tell you, it is even worse. Or at all events, it will be in summer when the warm weather comes. As I said, I believe you exaggerate the matter considerably. A capable physician ought to know what measures to take. He ought to be capable of preventing injurious influences or of remedying them if they become obviously persistent. Well, what more? The water supply for the baths is now an established fact and in consequence must be treated as such but probably the committee, at its discretion, will not be disinclined to consider the question of how far it might be possible to introduce certain improvements consistently with a reasonable expenditure. And do you suppose that I will have anything to do with such a piece of trickery as that? Trickery? Yes, it would be a trick, a fraud, a lie, a downright crime towards the public, towards the whole community. I have not, as I remarked before, been able to convince myself that there is actually any imminent danger. You have? It is impossible that you should not be convinced. I know I have represented the facts absolutely truthfully and fairly, and you know it very well, Peter, only you won't acknowledge it. It was only your action that both the baths and the water conduits were built where they are, and that is what you won't acknowledge. That damnable blunder of yours! Because I don't see through you. And even if that were true? If I perhaps guard my reputation somewhat anxiously, it is in the interests of the town. Without moral authority, I am powerless to direct public affairs, as it seems, to my judgment, to be best for the common good. And on that account, and for various other reasons too, it appears to me to be a matter of importance that your report should not be delivered to the committee. In the interest of the public, you must withhold it. Then later on, I will raise the question and we will do our best privately. But nothing of this unfortunate affair, not a single word of it, must come to the ears of the public. I am afraid you will not be able to prevent that now, my dear Peter. It must and shall be prevented. It is no use, I tell you. There are too many people that know about it that know about it? Who? Surely you don't mean those fellows on the People's Messenger? Yes, they know. The liberal-minded independent press is going to see that you do your duty. You are an extraordinarily independent man, Thomas. Have you given no thought to the consequences this may have for yourself? Consequences? For me? For you and yours, yes. 
What the deuce do you mean? I believe I have always behaved in a brotherly way to you. Haven't I always been ready to oblige or to help you? Yes, you have, and I am grateful to you for it. There is no need. Indeed, to some extent, I was forced to do so, for my own sake. I always hoped that if I helped to improve your financial position, I should be able to keep some check on you. What? Then it was only for your own sake? Up to a certain point, yes. It is painful for a man in the official position to have his nearest relative compromising himself time after time. And do you consider that I do that? Yes. Unfortunately, you do, without even being aware of it. You have a restless, pugnacious, rebellious disposition. And then there is that disastrous propensity of yours to want to write about every sort of possible and impossible thing. The moment an idea comes into your head, you must needs go and write a newspaper article or a whole pamphlet about it. Well, but is it not the duty of a citizen to let the public share in any new ideas he may have? <sighs> the public doesn't require any new ideas. The public is best served by the good established ideas it already has. That is your honest opinion? Yes. And for once, I must talk frankly to you. Hitherto, I have tried to avoid doing so, because I know now how irritable you are. But now I must tell you the truth, Thomas. You have no conception what an amount of harm you do yourself by your impetuosity. You complain of the authorities. You even complain of the government. You are always pulling them to pieces. You insist that you have been neglected and persecuted. But what else can such a cantankerous man as you expect? What next? Cantankerous, am I? Yes, Thomas. You are an extremely cantankerous man to work with. I know that to my cost. You disregard everything that you ought to have consideration for. You seem completely to forget that it is me you have to thank for your appointment here as medical officer to the baths. I was entitled to it as a matter of course. I and nobody else. I was the first person to see that the town could be made into a flourishing warting place, and I was the only one who saw it at that time. I had to fight single-handed in support of the idea for many years, and I wrote and wrote. Oh, undoubtedly. But things were not ripe for the scheme then. Though, of course, you could not judge of that in your out-of-the-way corner out and up north. But as soon as the opportune moment came, I, and the others, took the matter into our hands. Make this mess of all my beautiful plan. It's pretty obvious now what clever fellows you were. To my mind, the whole thing only seems to mean that you are seeking another outlet for your combativeness. You want to pick a quarrel with your superiors, an old habit of yours. You cannot put up with any authority over you. You look askance at anyone who occupies a superior official position. You regard him as a personal enemy, and then any stick is good enough to beat him with. But now I have called your attention to the fact that the town's interests are at stake, and incidentally my own too. And therefore I must tell you, Thomas, that you will find me inexorable with regards to what I am about to require you to do. And what is that? As you have been so indiscreet as to speak of this delicate matter to outsiders, despite the fact that you ought to have treated it as entirely official and confidential, it is obviously impossible to hush it up now. All sorts of rumours will get about directly, and everybody who has a grudge against us will take care to embellish these rumours. So, it will be necessary for you to refute them publicly. I? How? What? Um. What we shall expect is that, after making further investigations, you will come to the conclusion that the matter is not by any means as dangerous or as critical as you imagined in the first instance. Ah, so that is what you expect. And what is more, we shall expect you to make public profession of your confidence in the committee and in their readiness to consider fully and conscientiously what steps may be necessary to remedy any possible defects.
but you will never be able to do that by patching and tinkering at it. Never! Take my word for it, Peter. I mean what I say as deliberately and emphatically as possible. As an officer under the committee, you have no right to any individual opinion. No right? In your official capacity, no. As a private person, it is quite another matter. But as a subordinate member of the staff of the Baths, you have no right to express any opinion which runs contrary to that of your superiors. This is too much. I, a doctor, a man of science, have no right to... A matter in hand is not simply a scientific one. It is a complicated matter and has its economic as well as its technical side. I don't care what it is. I intend to be free to express my opinion on any subject under the sun. As you please, but not on any subject concerning the baths. That we forbid. You forbid? You? A pack of- I forbid it. I, your chief. And if I forbid it, you have to obey. Peter, if you were not my brother, uh, Father, you shan't stand this. Petra! Petra! Oh, so you've been eavesdropping. You were talking so loud we couldn't help it. Yes, I was listening. Well, after all, I am very glad. Saying something about forbidding and obeying? You obliged me to take that tone with you. And so I am to give myself the lie. Publicly. We consider it absolutely necessary that you should make some such public statement as I have asked for. And if I do not obey? Then we shall publish a statement ourselves to reassure the public. Very well. But in that case, I shall use my pen against you. I stick to what I have said. I will show that I am right and that you are wrong. And what will you do then? then I shall not be able to prevent your being dismissed. What? Father, dismissed? Dismissed? Dismissed from the staff of the baths. I shall be obliged to propose that you shall immediately be given notice and shall not be allowed any further participation in the baths' affairs. Who would dare to do that? <laughs> it is you that are playing the daring game. Uncle, that is a shameful way to cheat a man like father. Do hold your tongue, Petra. Oh, so we volunteer our opinions already, do we? Of course. Catherine, I imagine you are the most sensible person in this house. Use any influence you may have over your husband and make him see what this will entail for his family, as well as... My family is my own concern and nobody else's his own family, as I was saying, as well as with the town he lives in. It is I who have the real good of the town at heart. I want to lay bare the defects that sooner or later must come to the light of day. I will show whether I love my neighbor. You, who in your blind obstinacy want to cut off, the, cut off the most important source of the town's welfare? The source is poisoned, man. Are you mad? We are making our living by retailing filth and corruption. The whole of our flourishing municipal life derives its substance from a lie. All imagination, or something even worse. The man who can throw out such offensive insinuations about his native town must be an enemy to our community. Do you dare to? Thomas! Uh, don't lose your temper, father. I will not expose myself to violence. Now you have had a warning, so reflect on what you owe to yourself and your family. Goodbye. Am I to put up with such treatment as this? In my own house, Catherine? What do you think of that? Indeed, it is both shameful and absurd, Thomas. Oh, if only I could give Uncle a piece of my mind. It is my own fault. I ought to have flown out at him long ago, shown my teeth, bitten. To hear him call me an enemy to our community, me, I shall not take that lying down upon my soul. But, dear Thomas, 
Your brother has power on his side. Yes, but I have right on mine, I tell you. Yes, right, right. But what is this thing right on your side if you have not got might? Oh, mother, how can you say such a thing? You imagine that in a free country it is no use having right on your side? You are absurd, Catherine. Besides, I haven't got the liberal-minded independent press to lead the way and the compact majority behind me. That is might enough, I should think. But, good heavens, Thomas, you don't mean to. Don't mean to what? To set yourself up in opposition to your brother? In God's name, what else do you suppose I should do but take my stand on right and truth? Yes, I was just going to say that. But it won't do you any earthly good. If they won't do it, they won't. Oh, oh, Catherine, just give me time and you'll see how I will carry the war into their camp. Yes, you carry the war into their camp, but you get your dismissal. That is what you will do. In any case, I shall have done my duty towards the public, towards the community, I, who am called its enemy. But towards your family, Thomas, towards your own home. Do you think that is doing your duty towards those you have to provide for? Oh, I don't think always first verse, Mother. Oh, it is easy for you to talk. You are able to shift for yourself if need be. But remember the boys, Thomas, and think a little of yourself too, and of me. I think you are out of your senses, Catherine. If I were to be such a miserable coward as to go on my knees to Peter and his damned crew, do you suppose I should ever know an hour's peace of mind all my life afterwards? I don't know anything about that. But God preserve us from the peace of mind we shall have all the same if you go on defying him. You will find yourself again without the means of subsistence, with no income to count upon. I should think we had had enough of that in the old days. Remember that, Thomas. Think what that means. And this is what this slavery can bring upon a free, honourable man. Isn't it horrible, Catherine? Yes. It is sinful to treat you so, it is perfectly true. But good heavens, one has to put up with so much injustice in this world. There are the boys, Thomas. Look at them. What is to become of them? Oh, no, no, you can never have the heart. Eilif and Morton have come in while she was speaking with their school books in their hands. Oh, the boys. I... No, even if the whole world goes to pieces, I will never bow my neck to this yokel. Goes towards his room. Thomas, what are you going to do? I mean to have the right to look my sons in the face when they are grown men. God, help us all! Father is splendid. He will not give in. Boys look on in amazement. Petra signs to them not to speak. 